Computer Science 461, Chapter 23, Kokomo and Cost Estimation. So a little bit of pop quiz, see if you've been reading. Uh, one, what is Kokomo? Kokomo is actually a cost estimation model that's an algorithmic and analytic model for computing uh, cost estimates of software and development effort of software. Uh, Kokomo 81 is the original Kokomo model, and Kokomo 2 is the updated model that takes into account new types of system development, such as object-oriented programming, component-based systems, COTS, and glue code. It also takes into account database-intensive systems that were definitely not discussed in Kokomo 81. Uh, Kokomo with the K. That's actually a song by the Beach Boys from 1988, uh, so the song is in fact named after the software engineering model. Tom Cruise is a big fan there. So let's talk about software esti cost estimation, and where do you really get the cost estimates? And um, basically um, the boss here says, well, do you have the cost estimates? I'm waiting for Ted's input. He's on vacation. How about the revised time? I'm waiting for Ted and then you can steal office supplies from Ted as well. So uh, basically make sure that you say that you need the information from the person on vacation or uh, sabbatical. In all seriousness, uh, there are three cost parameters that you uh, need in order to uh, perform software cost estimation. Uh, one is hardware and software costs, travel and training time, and effort costs for paying the uh, developers. Now, the big cost here is the effort cost for the developers, uh, definitely when you're creating software. Uh, hardware, um, software training and travel tend to be relatively low compared to the cost of paying for uh, your developers. And remember that cost is more than just salary. Um, you have a lot of overhead there, uh, heating, lighting, cooling, office space, uh, cost of support staff, networking and communications, central facilities, uh, social security, employee benefits, uh, health care coverage. Uh, basically, the overhead cost results in about the same cost as a person's salary. So, remember the price you quote the customer should conform to the following simple equation. The price is equal to the cost plus the profit. Now, is it ever permissible to take a loss on a project? And yeah, and sometimes it is, uh, especially if it's going to result in uh, future work with that client. You might do a small project that uh, would take a, a short-term loss in exchange for a longer-term large gain. Uh, Somerville used to have a case study in the 7th and 8th editions, and if you have one of the old editions, you can find it there. Um, it does have uh, some problems. Um, Basically, uh, some real says, oh, it would take two years at a cost of $200,000 a year for the possibility of future work. I think you'd have to have a pretty great line of credit from the bank in order to take that sort of risk. And um, you might try to bid it out at near cost. But um, so, you know, like most of the case studies, it does have some problems. Uh, visibility in future projects are often really good reasons to take an initial hit uh, and underbid on a uh, project but uh, you don't want to do that too often. So factors that affect software pricing, one is market opportunity, uh, cost factor uncertainty, basically include a fudge factor in there so that you can move it uh, up a little higher than what you think it will cost so that you actually cover the cost. Contractual terms, uh, for example, the price may be less if you get the intellectual property rights requirements, volatility, and the financial health of the organization with whom you're doing business. Uh, basically, if the uh, company that you're doing business with isn't financially helpful or he healthy, you uh, will probably uh, want to request more of the money up front. Uh, question, will this product allow you to develop a unique product in the marketplace or put you into a positive position against a competitor? If so, you may want to lower the price a little bit. The uh, rest of those uh, will be fairly self-explanatory. So two ways to estimate productivity. One is size-related metrics, uh, basically lines of code. Um, make sure to include lots of comments to uh, pump that up. Um, there are some real problems with calculating productivity based on lines of code. Well, one, what is the complexity of the code that's being developed? Not all problems are equal. What language is the code being developed in? Think about the instruction explosion from assembly language 
or from C++ down to assembly language. You have a very simple line like an assignment statement. It takes one line in C++, it can take uh, three lines in an assembly language. And is the programmer padding how much code he or she is writing in order to look more productive? Um, you really have to approach this in the same way as Fagan inspections and not use the data for performance evaluation reviews. Uh, second way is to look at function related metrics. And these are function points and object points. Uh, let's take a look, closer look at these uh, function points. So a function point is not a single characteristic, but it's computed by estimating several different features. External inputs and outputs, user interactions, external interfaces, and files used by the system. Of course, you apply weights to each type of those, and then the unadjusted function point count, or UFC, is equal to the sum of the number of different types of an element multiplied by their weight. Uh, Simmons suggests that function point count depends upon who is giving the estimate, and different people have different ways of estimating complexity, so this is, a, again, a subjective measure. Uh, function points are <clears throat> good for imperative languages, uh, if you're using something different, you may want to consider a technique called object points. And these were created uh, by Banker and his team. And these are used for non-imperative languages, and in particular databases. They're not object classes, but they're based upon the number of separate screens in complexity. You can give one to three points for the uh, individual screen, number of reports produced in the complexity, either two, five, or eight points for a report and the number of modules in imperative languages must be developed to supplement the database. And those are given at 10 points a module. These are easier estimates and function points for high level specification. So some factors that impact programmer productivity. Uh, one is the application domain experience. Uh, are they experienced in working in that particular domain? Second is the process quality of the organization. Consider a CMM level one organization versus five. And we haven't quite gotten to CMM yet, but that's the capability maturity model. And a level one organization tends to be pretty unorganized, whereas a level five tends to be highly organized and optimizing. So level five is going to um, be far more productive than a level one. Project size, technology support, and of course the working environment. Uh, quiet work areas with privacy contribute to uh, improved productivity, uh, giving away free caffeine to workers like IBM, and Google of course is uh, pretty amazing too, which is why there's the uh, link down there to uh, some of the uh, seriously cool workplaces. Uh, take a look at uh, you know what you can expect in a state-of-the-art state uh, software development company. It's uh, different from the cube farm that you might imagine. Estimation techniques. Uh, Microsoft came up with the pumpkin math for the clip art. I'm just going to go with that. So there's no simple way to estimate how much effort and how much cost there is for a piece of software. Um, I will say the project cost estimates uh, are often self-fulfilling. That is uh, basically what you <clears throat> pick out for it is uh, what it will cost. So techniques, and these are from uh, Barry Bame. Uh, he wrote these in 1981, but they're still the primary techniques that are used today. One is algorithmic cost modeling, and this is a formulaic approach used to compute project effort based on estimates of project attributes, such as size and process characteristics, such as the number of staff involved, or the experience of the staff involved. Expert judgment, exactly what it says on the 10, you ask an expert in the area. How much do you think this will cost? He or she gives you an estimate, and that's what you go with. Estimation by analogy says you can estimate based on previous experiences. So it took us uh, this much effort to do a project of similar scope. It will probably take a similar amount of effort to do this one. Uh, you can use Parkinson's Law um, for your assignment estimates, and Parkinson's Law basically says work expands to fill the time allocated for its completion. In general, whatever you estimate it is um, it to be is what it'll end up costing. And pricing to win basically is pricing uh, whatever the customer has available to uh, spend and making sure that you get the uh, project. 
Now, the best method is not a single method. And like uh, Rajane says in analytic modeling, use a variety of techniques and compare their results. Basically, all estimates uh, should remain suspect until they're validated by some other estimation technique. And uh, there's a little Dilbert cartoon that illustrates uh, the concept of uh, pricing to win. The other thing is cost uncertainty. Early in the process, uh, you're going to be less certain as to what the cost is, but by the time you deliver the software, you should pretty much know what the cost is. Okay, so this is a fairly self-explanatory graph from uh, Somerville, uh, but it does illustrate a point that the further you go along, the better bounds you have on what it is going to cost. So let's take a look at algorithmic cost modeling. Um, it's going to be my favorite since it involves a lot of math. So why don't we head on down to uh, Kokomo and uh, take a look at how this uh, works. So algorithmic cost modeling uses a mathematical formula to predict project costs based on estimates of project size, number of software engineers, and other project factors. The most general formula is effort is equal to A times size raised to B times M. And A, B, and M are parameters that you determine. A is local practices and type of software. M is a multiplier by, made by combining product, process, and development attributes. And B is between 1 and 1.5. The size does not have a linear relationship with effort. So there are some difficulties. One, it's pretty difficult to estimate size. Um, estimates for B and M are subjective and um, Basically, the model that you use may not incorporate all the variables that you have in your project. Also, your organization may not have enough of a past history to get the numbers or to uh, prime those numbers into an algorithmic cost model. So the best thing to do is do a best, worst, and average case model and kind of uh, see what the bounds are there. So basic Kokomo was made in 1981, and there are three levels. One is initial rough estimate, two is modified uh, using the number of project and process multipliers, and three is estimation for different phases. Uh, Kokomo 1981 has assumptions of having an imperative language, and two uh, using the waterfall model. So here's Kokomo 81 in a nutshell, and this is actually fairly easy compared to some of the more advanced algorithmic cost modeling uh, methods. Um, basically, if it's a simple project, the uh, person months is equal to 2.4 times thousands of lines of delivered source instructions raised to the 1.05 times M. Uh, moderate 3.0 times KDSI raised to the 1.12 times M and embedded basically complex projects where the part, software is uh, strongly coupled with hardware, software, regulations, and operational procedures. That's 3.6 times thousands of delivered source instructions raised to the 1.2 times n. So that was Kokomo 1981, but uh, a lot's changed since the 1980s. Uh, for one thing, cell phones have gotten a bit smaller. Uh, we have uh, off-the-shelf components, uh, more database intensive applications, case tools, uh, object-oriented programming is definitely more in vogue, distributed systems, online systems, uh, and, and agile methods have uh, come into the, the fore. So Kokomo 2 uh, recognizes several of these uh, different things that are going on and it looks at several different types of approaches and you have several sub-modules. Um, we'll take a look at this figure 23.10. Uh, you can find it on page 637 in the ninth edition if you're uh, so inclined to um, get a picture of it that isn't uh, somewhat muddied by uh, Somerville's um, online figures. So here's 23.10, the submodules of Kokomo 2. Uh, it's a bit difficult to uh, read this slide, but the figure in your book will give you a clearer idea of what's on it. Uh, so here you have uh, four different modules. We'll start with the top one. This is the application composition model, which shows the effort required to develop systems for scripting or database programs. Next is the early design model that's used during the early stages of the system design after the requirements have been established. Estimates are based on function points, which are then converted to a number of lines of source code. 
The third is a reuse model to compute the effort required to integrate reusable components and or to automatically generate program code. And last is a post-architectural model, which is used to give a more accurate estimation of software cost after the system architecture has been designed. In addition to these four sub-models, uh, Kokomo 2 has a larger number of factors that influence M and B is a bit larger. So Kokomo 2 is a fairly good model and it's based on a lot of empirical research that were done by Bain and his team at USC. Uh, however, its practical use is limited. Uh, few organizations have enough data to support calibrating the model for their own purposes and so you have to use uh, published values. Now it is very good for what if scenarios and there are a couple of those featured in uh, figures 23.11 and 23.13. Uh, here's an example. This is 23.13. Um, here we can see uh, basically two estimates. The um, first one is the standard, which is 730 um, person months, and this is without cost drivers. Now, if you have everything go wrong, uh, you need very high reliability, very high complexity, high memory constraints. That is, you have to be very careful about using memory. Uh, you don't use uh, any advanced tools and you're working on an accelerated schedule. Uh, it's going to take about 2,306 uh, person months according to Kokomo 2. Uh, now if you have uh, just need very low reliability, it's not complex, uh, you use as much memory as you darn well please and you have some advanced prototyping and advanced code construction tools and uh, the schedule's not uh, pressure packed, uh, then it's going to take about 295 person months. So you can see a very high amount of variability and basically it's uh, what is the scenario. So you can take a look at those different factors and basically do some calculation to get an idea as to what it is. Now it's probably going to actually fall somewhere between the 295 and 2306 person months. But again, it depends on those factors of reliability, complexity, memory constraint, tool use, and schedule. The other thing you can do is you can use Kokomo for trade-offs. And this is basically used in conjunction, this table is used in conjunction um, with the scenario explored in the earlier edition of the text. In this graph, he's actually comparing six different options as to how to improve the project. In each case, he uh, derives the effort, software costs, and hardware costs based on A, use of existing staff and technology, um, B, processor and memory upgrade, C, memory upgrade only, D, more experienced staff, of course he really needs to find that, new system development, and staff with hardware experience. After plugging into the Kokomo 2 model, he determines that more experienced staff will result in lowest total cost. This could probably be derived uh, from just general observation and without the uh, made up figures, but you can see it can look between different uh, types of trade off. Uh, final note on pro project duration staffing uh, the relationship between the number of staff working on the project and the total effort required is definitely not linear. Kokomo says that the time required to complete the project is a function of the total effort required for the project. It does not depend upon the number of software engineers working on the project. And, of course, the uh, famous law from Fred Brooks is adding manpower to a late project makes it later. And that's known as Brooks Law. So that's it for the software engineering side of things. In a related lecture, we'll see how businesses and management information systems deal with this aspect of software uh, engineering and software implementation.